And thank you for, for asking me to, to talk about uh, in, infection control. And, and uh, I think uh, we'll, we'll try and, and keep the, this um, open for, for questions or, or, or comments. And I think you, you can uh, raise, raise your hand if, if someone can tell me if someone's got a question, we'll try and answer it on the spot. Uh, I think that uh, we, we, since the pandemic has pretty well faded, there's quite a few new people in, in TB control around around the country. And, and this is always a subject that needs to be uh, re revisited um, because there are still many uh, questions and issues regarding TB and infection control and prevention of infection how long to keep people in isolation, who should be in isolation. And, and I will try my best to, to, to go over this topic. Uh, we do not have all the answers to uh, everything, but we'll, we'll try, try and uh, help you with the subject. My next slide. So, so we're going to talk about, uh, um, sorry, let me go back up. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, what our objectives are. We want to decide when to place a patient into isolation, uh, which is a big decision to make. As you know, putting a patient in isolation, uh, it, it, it can be very difficult for the patients. It puts some stigma on the patients. Uh, it has psychological implications. But on the other hand, it's very, very necessary when you suspect a contagious pulmonary infection. Uh, we will discuss when you can remove a patient from isolation. Uh, 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 this is a big subject. Either, either we've eliminated the diagnosis of tuberculosis uh, and taken them out of isolation, or we've made a diagnosis of tuberculosis, put the patient on treatment, and then the question is, when can the patient come out of isolation? This, uh, this, this topic right here, probably causes the most arguments that we have in, in, in the TB clinics. Um, we'll talk about how, how to best protect you and, and your hospital staff or your clinic staff from TB infection and how to reduce the duration of isolation. Uh, at the, at the uh, national TB conference that was held in June, there was a, a, a new session on isolation and tuberculosis, this is a topic that has not really been reviewed for the past 20 years. And, and there is a lot of um, plans to update the, the, the science and, and the guidelines, so, so stay tuned on this topic. There is some terminology which you may or may not be uh, familiar with. Uh, the word administrative controls, this is basically policies and procedures, which sound boring, and they sit in a policy manual so somewhere, but these still remain very, very important for, for prevention of transmission of TB. We do talk about isolation. The official term is airborne infection isolation, uh, or AII. Uh, this this phrase is, is not universally used around the country. Sometimes it's just called airborne isolation. We tend not to use the word tuberculosis isolation because then that puts a, a possible diagnosis on the, on the patient's door. And so we, 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 use, we use this term. Uh, we will talk about cough-inducing procedures such as sputum inductions. Uh, we'll discuss environmental controls, which are basically mechanical things like closing doors and having special ventilation to, to protect the environment fit testing of masks to make sure they fit properly, a HEPA filter, which is a high efficiency particulate filter to trap TB particles, negative pressure, which consists of rooms that have negative pressure or lower pressure compared to the adjacent rooms. This prevents the, the spread of droplets with TB from drifting on air currents into other rooms. I think everyone's familiar with what N95 masks are now after the pandemic, but we will also talk about what the role of plain old surgical masks is and uh, uh, ultraviolet light, which we won't discuss too much. 
So this is this is the the slide that CDC has been using for for years about uh, transmission of, of tuberculosis, and you can see on the patient on the left is a is a person who's got red dots in his lung. He's full of tuberculosis, and when he coughs or breathes, uh, these droplets can be expelled. They can float across in the air some distance, and then your vulnerable person, whether that person is a family member or that person is a healthcare worker, could breathe in the TB droplets and, and, and get TB in their lungs. And this is what we try very, very hard to, to prevent. And I should know this on a firsthand basis because I got infected with tuberculosis uh, uh, when I was a medical student. Uh, we didn't realize that the person on the left had tuberculosis. Uh, we called him pneumonia for two weeks. And I was a young medical student. So of course I spent the most time with the patient breathing in his droplets before we finally stumbled onto his diagnosis of tuberculosis. I never became sick. I had latent tuberculosis, but in full disclosure, I have taken my antibiotic for latent TB infection. But we want to prevent these kind of, of, of situations to happen to you or, or your staff. Uh, and, and this is still a very important thing. Now, uh, on the right is, is the vulnerable person, and, and, and you can see the lungs, but the most important part about this person on, on the right is the person's brain. In other words, we want the person on the right to be thinking and keeping TB as a possibility when they're evaluating this symptomatic person on the left. And really, the brain is our biggest source of, of protection against tuberculosis. For me and my team when I was a medical student, we didn't even consider tuberculosis as a, as a possibility. So our brains were not functioning as alertly as, as they could. Now, one of the things that we face in 2023 uh, uh, compared to many years ago when I was infected is that the, the, the incidence of pulmonary tuberculosis in the United States is at the lowest in history. This is very, very good. This means we've done a good job, but this means that many doctors are not accustomed to considering tuberculosis uh, and they may be rusty or they think it's gone. And, and we still run into uh, difficulties with, with that. That's why we want to keep these education programs alive and keep everyone properly aware. Now, when we talk about safety against tuberculosis, it's sort of like automobile safe, safety. In other words, when you're driving your car on the interstate th this morning, your main uh, safety approach was really watching the road ahead, watching who's around you, watching the traffic, watching the, the, the conditions of the road. These are what we would call administrative controls in the hospital, being alert and watching around you and thinking about, about things. If we see something that's starting to uh, happen on the road ahead of us, we may apply our brakes, and this, this would be equivalent to environmental controls in the hospital, where then we apply uh, private rooms, or we close doors, or we turn on special ve ventilation. And then the last thing we want to do with automobile safety is use our airbags to protect us from major injury, but they are there. And, and the last thing we want to do with TB control is, 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 is have, to, have to deploy all these other mechanical uh, uh, interventions. But, but we do use this hierarchy, uh, and this has been in place for many, many years. Uh, and, and really, we spend most of our time talking about the bottom with respiratory protection and N95 masks. We spend some time talking about environmental controls and, and private rooms and negative pressure controls. But really, the greatest source of protection is going to be administrative controls. In other words, making doctors and nurses uh, aware that it might be TB and to think about TB before you have to trigger all these other uh, uh, things. Now, this is so, you know, we always put policies in our infection control policy, but uh, and then they get forgotten uh, or, or neglected. 
but these take quite a bit of uh, need for us to frequently bring up these questions when we're talking with other doctors and nurses to keep raising these, these, these matters so that people are aware. As you know, when in the TB program, probably the most frequent comment I get from a doctor or nurse was, oh, I thought TB was gone, uh, that it's not, no longer present. And I don't try and alarm them or scare them, but I say, well, you know, we still have cases and we've had cases that, that come in that are where the diagnosis is missed or it's given some other diagnosis and we still have to be conscious of this. So, so if I go back to the CDC slide, I put a big blue arrow here on the right for administrative controls, which is pointing at the brain of the vulnerable person. We want that person to be thinking about TB uh, uh, and then they can implement uh, 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 protection. Uh, the, the vertical arrow is environmental controls. In other words, we're trying to put a barrier, whether it's a wall or a mask or something between the vulnerable person and, and, and the contagious person to reduce uh, aerosols. Now, when I'm talking with my medical students or when I'm talking with my interns or my residents or my pulmonary doctors or my infectious disease doctors or my emergency room doctors, uh, and all of these people are on the front lines for getting accidentally exposed to tuberculosis, we don't want to over isolate people, uh, but we don't want to miss cases. So, so we say if you're, we should be suspecting TB if you're seeing a patient who's been coughing more than two or three weeks. In other words, TB is usually a chronic infection. This is not going to be like COVID-19, which comes on quickly or like influenza or other respiratory viruses. Even community acquired pneumonia usually is symptomatic maybe for a week but before they present. But if someone comes in uh, to, to your emergency room uh, this morning and they said, I've been coughing since the middle of August and, and it's not getting better with, with uh, uh, treatment and it's chronic, then your little antennas are going to start to, to go up to, to maybe put this as a possibility. Now, if a patient comes into the emergency room and has gross hemoptysis, now by gross hemoptysis, this means like a spoonful of blood, not little dots of blood. Very common for people to cough up little specks of blood just from, from bronchitis. But if you have gross hemoptysis, this should be grounds for immediate isolation to rule out tuberculosis. This is still quite forgotten. Most doctors would say gross hemoptysis, so that could be due to a pulmonary embolism, or maybe they have lung cancer, and those are, those are other possibilities. But tuberculosis needs to be uh, uh, considered in, in that case. We, we would want to ask the patients maybe a few pointed questions about exposure to TB. And, and, and what I mean by pointed is that you might need to ask them two or three different ways uh, about their exposure rather than just a simple line. You know, have you been exposed to TB? Did you know anyone who had TB? Have you ever had a positive PPD or, or IGRA blood test like a quantifuron in, in the past? Uh, just sort of digging, probing a little bit. Uh, and, and particularly if patients come from an endemic country where there are higher rates of TB, that's going to raise your antennas quite a bit. You know, we talk about the incidence of tuberculosis in the United States is, is very low. Uh, that means right now, uh, may, for maybe every 100,000 people in the United States, there may be one or two people with pulmonary TB. That's very low. But if you go to, to other parts of the world, uh, particularly Africa or Asia, uh, but also uh, uh, Central and South America or Western Europe, including the Ukraine, for example, you may those people may be coming from an area with 100 times greater rate of tuberculosis. 
That means that if you're sitting in an emergency room, seeing someone who's been coughing for three weeks and they come from Asia, the chance of that person having tuberculosis is 100 times higher than if it was just a, a U.S. born person with, with, with cough. And that kind of balancing risk and, and epidemiology is very, very important. It's often an underappreciated clue. Now, that's not to say that we can't see tuberculosis in Americans. We certainly do continue to see TB in vulnerable, neglected, underserved Americans, particularly if they have substance abuse, homelessness, uh, uh, HIV, uh, uh, things like that that might make them more, more susceptible. So we want doctors just to be aware of these are the clues that patients could come in with uh, uh, and, and then maybe think that this person might have, have TB. Now, for example, here's a case that we had in our emergency room five years ago. Uh, this, is the, this is just a direct copy of the, of the triage nurse who, who said this patient came in with blood in the vomit uh, for one day. Now, it turned out not to be in the vomit. It turned out to be in the sputum. But, you know, it can be confusing for, for nurses and even the patient. The patient was reported she was 30 weeks pregnant. Uh, she, she had a little bit of cramping, but she also had blood tinged sputum with coughing. Then she reported that her coughing was so bad she was hospitalized with pneumonia a month earlier. Now, this is straight from the, 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 the triage nurse. The emergency room physician who, who was working uh, that day was told that the patient had gross hemoptysis of two tablespoons two tablespoons of, of bloody sputum. The emergency room doctor noted the patient was originally from Africa, from a country in Guinea, and without even getting a chest x-ray, the emergency room doctor said, put this woman into airborne infection, isolation, and then get x-rays. And obviously, I'm telling you the story because this doctor made the correct uh, 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 decision in, in this case, but this was based on gross hemoptysis, chronic cough over a month, uh, and coming from a country with 200 times as much tuberculosis as in, in the United States. And and uh, uh, on the right side, uh, I don't know, if, I don't know, Shawada, can, can you see my mouse moving uh, on the screen, Shawada? Maybe not. Yes, I can see it. Uh oh, so the mouse is circling this sort of mottled uh, area in the right lung with lucencies, and this looked like a pneumonia kind of picture, but there's cavitation, uh, and this is where the patient's tuberculosis was. I I went personally to that emergency room doctor and thanked that doctor for promptly putting this patient into into airborne isolation on the basis of gross hemoptysis. Otherwise, this patient would have been admitted to the obstetrical unit and treated for community-acquired pneumonia uh, for a second time, and, and that would have caused a big disaster. So this person was put into isolation probably in within an hour of arriving to, to the hospital, avoiding a major nosocomial exposure to contagious tuberculosis. This is what we like to see. Now, as, as you know, and those of you who work in hospitals, it's not usually this clean and, and orderly uh, and, and, and can be much more confusing. There's her tuberculosis. So the most important component here was the administrative component. In other words, the mind of the emergency room doctor was, was functioning properly and considered TB as a possibility. Uh, and, uh, and we do have to recognize, of course, that not every person that we put into isolation has tuberculosis. Um, I frequently get teased or, or doctors will complain to me that I'm always putting patients into isolation for tuberculosis. Here he goes again, he's putting them into isolation. We don't think this patient has TB. Um, and most of the time, they don't have TB. They turn out to have something else that's going on. They could have a community-acquired pneumonia. They could have a neoplasm. 
They might have something unusual like a fungus infection. Um, but but we don't, until you know and until you've proven that, you don't want to take a chance with, with exposing your hospital staff and maybe other patients in, in, in the hospital. So we would guess that you might have to isolate 10 patients to discover a single case of active TB. It, you might even have to isolate 20 patients. And people grumble about it. And it, it. and it is a pain for the person to be put into a private room and everything is restricted uh, uh, to do this. And so you want to try and get this over as quickly as possible. But remember, this is sort of like when, when you worry about myocardial infarction or heart attack. When patients come in with chest pain, we are always checking them for myocardial infarction. Uh, and we, we probably will have to test 20 patients uh, with chest pain before you find a single myocardial infarction, but we don't want to miss that. The difference with TB, of course, is that this requires isolation and then that, that's, that's uh, uh, causing more social and psychological and, and, and patient care issues with being in isolation. So there are seven factors that can affect how the infectiousness of a patient or how contagious the patient, patient is. Certainly presence of a cough is, is the main one because then the patient is going to be expelling droplets. If a chest X-ray is showing a cavity in the lung, then we start to get more paranoid that this might be t t tuberculosis. Now, a cavity means a hole or necrosis or a piece of dead lung in there that's empty. Uh, and that certainly should make any physician concerned about tuberculosis. But other things can cause cavities like a lung abscess or a cancer or sometimes a fungus infection can cause a cavity. It's not proof that there's TB, but it raises the concern uh, uh, of TB. Obviously, if you have a positive acid fast smear result on the sputum, then you're worried about TB, but it's still not proof. We still need to get the polymerase chain reaction to, to, to prove that uh, because there can be other organisms which we call non-tuberculous mi mycobacteria. It is said that if patients have TB of the larynx, which is a little less common, they might be more contagious, but these patients probably also have pulmonary TB. Um, <clears throat> and so they're probably about the same. Uh, pa patients who are not pra practicing cough hygiene, like covering their mouth or their nose or coughing, are gonna be, excuse me, <clears throat> spraying TB droplets all over the place. If a patient is not receiving adequate treatment for TB, of course, that's a concern. Uh, and we also talk about cough-inducing procedures. A bronchoscopy is a cough-inducing procedure. If you do a bronchoscopy on a patient who has tuberculosis and you forgot to consider tuberculosis, you're going to be triggering a, a, a lot of droplets and, 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 and really going into a contagious case. This does happen at our institution maybe every two or three years ago where, where, where a patient has a bronchoscopy uh, and the, sur the, the, the physician doing the procedure never considered TB as, as, as a possibility. So, all right, let's say you're in the emergency room or let's say you're in triage and you've got this patient who's got some cough and some things on the x-ray or some parts of the history that you don't like and then you're gonna Put, you're going to put the order in for airborne infection isolation. That means you got to put this person into a private room. We, this room needs to have negative pressure. What this means is that, and for example, if I'm sitting in my little office here, this means that the air in my in my office is going to be lower air pressure than out in the hallway next to me, so that any air is is not going to go come from my office and go out into the hallway and spread to other people. This requires special uh, uh, fans and ventilation for your hospital engineers to maintain. Uh, now, they, what they, when they say six air exchanges per hour, what that means is that in one hour, all the air in my room would be, would be removed six times. 
time. This is a lot of air movement. And now the new guidelines, they, they want the engineers to get up to 12 air exchanges per hour. This is a, these are somewhat expensive systems to run. Uh, during summertime, this means nice air conditioned air is being uh, exhausted out, out the roof of a building. In the winter, it means nice warm air is being exhausted, but this will quickly remove any suspended droplets from the air and get them out of the building. Once they're out of the building, uh, they're, they're, this air is filtered and it does not pose any risk to the community. We put a sign on the door that the patient is in airborne isolation. We don't put AFB isolation or TB isolation because they certainly have something else. And then we're going to wear our N95 respirators, which we're all familiar with from pandemic. This is a sign that we use at our hospital. Uh, uh, this one's in Arabic because we have an Arabic community. If you have ethnic communities, I would recommend you have English and foreign language signs, whether it's Spanish or Arabic or whatever. And this is because one of the huge problems is friends and family who waltz into the into the patient's room not not able to read the, the English signage. So so the, this is an, an, an important component, but you want to have a sign on there that says you need to wear a, a mask when you're coming into the room. You need to keep the door closed. You need to avoid cough inducing procedures and you need to wash your hands, of course. Now you don't need to worry about the technical uh, aspect of this, but your hospital engineers are gonna be very familiar with the mechanical ventilation needs for, for, for these patients. Uh, uh, and and uh, sometimes these systems will malfunction. Sometimes an alarm will go off. You need to contact your hospital engineering to work on, on the air handling con controls. And there are actually national guidelines for hospital architects and engineers to calibrate uh, the, the, these, the, these special rooms. Now we're all familiar with N95 masks. We wore them all the time during during the pandemic, uh, and they're tight and they're stuffy and, and they get humid and, and and they can be a bit uncomfortable. But but these are designed to filter out any droplets so that you can take a nice deep breath and it will be free of droplets from the patient, whether those are droplets with coronavirus or, or, or tuberculosis. Now, typically the hospital will, will try and do a fit test on you just to make sure it fits the shape of your face. Uh, if you have facial hair or a beard, that, that can interfere with these and you have to, have to be careful for this. But we don't put these on patients and I'll, I'll explain to you why in, in a sec in a second these are these are designed to protect us from breathing in droplets if a patient with tuberculosis has to wear a mask let's say they have to go down for a cat scan or an x-ray or something then we put a surgical mask on now this is designed so when the patient breathes or coughs, the, the mask is trapping any droplets and preventing them from spreading. An N95 mask is not really desi designed for that. Um, and so, so we put, that's where, that's the role of surgical mask. Now, obviously, if you have a patient with suspected TB, you're going to reduce very much their need to go for other tests that might be, might you might be able to postpone them until you figured out whether they have tuberculosis. This is something that requires close communication between the infection control staff at a hospital and the nursing staff and the radiology staff or the procedural staff that may want to move the patient around for a, a test. And, and often this requires some face-to-face -face discussion with your staff so they understand how to safely move the patient around when necessary. Now, uh, you may or may not be familiar with the placebo mask, uh, a placebo mask, uh, and, and I run into this uh, uh, not infrequently, 
uh, a placebo mask is when you've got a, a patient in isolation and, and, and then the nurse or the doctor needs to quickly run in and you know check check the IV pump or quickly check some little thing. And so then they just sort of put the mask on their face and they put maybe one strap on and they run into the room to quickly do something and then quickly dash out. And I call those placebo masks where they're not doing putting it on properly, and then you're really not getting the, the, the tight seal and tight fit. This is a bit more uh, uh, common than we, we care to, to, to admit. And if I encounter another healthcare worker doing that, I usually take them aside and say, listen, we, we give you this equipment, but you've got to wear it properly. I know it's a little bit of a pain to put on the mask, but I want to protect you so that you don't get latent tuberculosis like I did. Now, let's go back to that case from five years ago where this pregnant woman uh, 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 is, is, was in the emergency room. She was put in isolation in the emergency room. And then the doctor says, okay, she's got something in her lungs. She might have TB. And now she's going to go up to the, the medical floor in isolation, of course. And then the nurse manager in the emergency room is going to say, well, when can we put another patient in her emergency room uh, uh, that, that was used? And of course, you know, ERs are busy. They got people piled up in the waiting room. Can they quickly, when can they safely use that room again after a contagious TB patient was in that room? And this is a, a, a question that is, is, is not that, that unusual. You don't, want, you don't need to wait 24 hours. You don't need to wait 12 hours. You, you can do this. Um, get my slide to work. It takes about 60 minutes to, to, to be adequately ventilated. Within 46 minutes, 99% of any airborne contaminants have been removed from the, the isolation room by, by your vent ventilation system. So we consider 60 minutes to be adequate in, in this situation. And that's the guideline that we, we, we uh, use in, in our hospital system. <laughs> this information is is actually a little bit difficult to, to find. You have to go back into an MMWR uh, review on control of tuberculosis from 2005. Uh, it's, it's very helpful to, to read this and, and understand this, uh, uh, and, and, but this is sometimes a little bit difficult if you're in an infection control department and you're trying to find where are these suggestions printed. This is one of the reasons why uh, at our national meeting, there's there's a movement now to revisit all the all the guidelines on uh, isolation. Now, on the other hand, you know, you ninety percent of our patients, or maybe more than ninety percent of our patients who are placed in isolation, don't have TB. They have something else going on, but you have to you have to quickly assess them for TB and how can we get them released quickly from isolation so they can go on with their regular medical care. It is probably well recognized that if you put a patient in isolation, the number of doc, the amount of doctor and nurse time that's that's face to face is probably reduced by 75%. So that means the doctors are flitting in and out. They don't want to talk with the patient much. Uh, they, they're not really tending to the patient's concerns or questions. Uh, and, and so isolation is, is not so good for patients in, in, in many respects. And so, how, and, and, and so how do we quickly get them out there? Well, we want to get a good, decent sputum so that we can analyze that sputum under the microscope. What this means is that if we go in there and say, okay, give me some sputum, uh, and we put a little cup there next to the bed, the patient may or may not give you a good sputum. In other words, somebody needs to coach this person and say, 
I want you to give me a good, deep specimen. I want you to cough. I don't want saliva to go in the in the cup. And, and, and we often underappreciate this, where we just come in a few hours later and we take whatever the, the patient spit into, into the cup and, and we test that. Sometimes we have to coach the nurse on how to coach the patient on how, how to do that so that we can get a better answer. Sometimes if the patient isn't bringing up much sputum, uh, then we'll have to ask pulmonary department or respiratory therapy department to come in and use a nebulizer to loosen up the sputum. Now, your respiratory therapist will, will say, well, we are not permitted to do sputum. Uh, uh, we are not permitted to use nebulizers for contagious patients. But then we explain, well, this is done for diagnostic purposes, not for treatment of bronchospasm. Uh, and, and, and that if you can help us get a good sputum from the patient, then we can get them out of isolation sooner than, than respiratory therapists can understand why they're being requested to go in there and get you a decent, deep pulmonary specimen. We're going to send that sample for AFB smear, which we've done for, for 100 years, and that's a nice, quick test. But what's really happened in the last decade, and this has moved into prime time now, is you're always going to do a PCR, or the, the CDC word is NAT, which means nucleic acid amplification. You're going to do one of these PCR DNA tests on the sputum, whether or not we see at AFB organisms uh, uh, on, on the smear. This has been a bit of a game changer uh, for, for us. Uh, uh, it's, it's taken some time to learn how to do this test and how, how to get it accomplished. Sometimes your hospital laboratory can actually do this test uh, in, in the laboratory. Sometimes this has to be sent out to another reference laboratory, which can take more time. We're fortunate in our hospital that, that, that we have the gene expert uh, 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 machine. If we get sputum on a patient uh, at nine o'clock in the morning and, and we take that promptly down to the laboratory, <clears throat> excuse me, we can often get a result on, on the smear and the PCR by 1, 1 p.m. the same day. That can greatly expedite care of the patient, whether you found out that they had TB or whether you, you were ruling out tuberculosis. So the National TB Controllers Association has helped develop this consensus statement. This is on the use of GeneXpert, which is made by this company, uh, uh, and they came out with this rapid assay for, for how to decide when to discontinue airborne isolation in healthcare settings. And this document is available online. And 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 I'm I'm sorry this slide looks a little complicated. It's not as bad as it look. Not as bad as it looks. If you look at um, uh, step number one, you're going to collect your sputum. Hopefully, you got a nice good sputum, and you're going to send it down to 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 the lab. And if it's in orange on the left, where you have a positive uh, gene expert for DNA linked to tuberculosis, that means that it says TB is likely. We would say that TB is, is very, very likely. And, and, and you're going to continue airborne infection isolation in, in, in the dark, dark blue there. You've basically made the diagnosis. And, it, and you, you may be able to make the diagnosis of TB with the same day the patient's admitted. If you've got a good sputum and you have a good laboratory that, that can, can run things. Um, now, uh, on the other hand, you may have a negative expert result. So you worry about TB, you send the specimen down, they do not find a DNA from tuberculosis. But we say, well, you, you know, that's less likely that you've got TB, but you haven't quite excluded it. Uh, and this is sort of similar to what you do uh, when you're worried about myocardial infarction. We will send one blood test down for troponin, 
uh, test, but a negative test on troponin, you usually want to do one or two more tests before you're confident about it. So, so if your test is negative, then you're going to go to step two, which means you're going to test the second sputum. Uh, some people say you should wait at least eight hours uh, uh, between between the two samples, but you're going to do two sputums by smear and by gene expert. If the second one is positive for TB, then you have made the diagnosis. If the second one is negative for TB, it, do, it does strongly suggest that infectious TB is not likely and, and that your decision to discontinue isolation will be done in conjunction with clinical data. So it's not a knee-jerk reaction just to automatically take the patient out of isolation, but you're going to say, okay, well, uh, we've got two negative uh, 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 gene experts. Uh, the patient probably has some other diagnosis. Maybe your other uh, uh, cultures or tests came back positive. Um, and, and you could probably take the patient out of isolation. On, on the other hand, if the patient has issues in their history, like coming from an endemic country uh, or, or coming with a history of substance abuse or coming with other problems, and you could potentially still have a nagging doubt about TB, then it may need to be continued until you can get more tissue or testing. Um, but this two-step, uh, two PCRs uh, uh, thing has really helped us to get a lot of patients out of isolation earlier, and it's also helped us make the diagnosis of TB a lot earlier than we used to be able to do. Now, this particularly um, comes in, into play um, uh, in, in, when, when you have a positive acid fast smear, so everyone's all agitated that the patient may have tuberculosis, but then your, your gene expert PCR is negative. And if you do that test twice, then that strongly tells us that these acid fast organisms, which do not have DNA from tuberculosis, are likely to be some other non-contagious uh, mycobacteria like Mycobacterium avium or the other non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Uh, this is a subject that's, that's growing across the United States because in, in we, we see these non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections more and more frequently in clinical care. So, so if you have two negative tests, uh, uh, you're, you're probably going to um, uh, uh, rule out TB and take the patient out of, out of isolation. This is if the patient has an AFB smear. Now, you can take patients out when TB is considered unlikely, and maybe you've made another diagnosis. Maybe your test for community-acquired pneumonia is positive, or maybe you found uh, a, a lung abscess, or you've made another diagnosis. Um, they used to say you needed three negative AFB sputums, but now with the, the NAT test, the nucleic acid amplification test, two of those tests that are negative are considered good to take patient out of isolation. Any questions at, the, at that at this stage before we move on to some stickier questions? We do have a couple of questions. Okay. Uh one is, you said that it takes 60 minutes to clear a room after somebody's infectious has been in it. Yes. Does yes. it matter on the air exchange in that room? So if you've got somebody, we oftentimes put people in a motel if they're um, unhoused, and then the manager wants to know when they can put another resident in there after the person leaves. Well, now, now I'm talking about hospital room, you know, so, so whether it's your emergency room, or your your medical surgical room uh, on, on the floor uh, that those are negative pressure rooms. Now, when you put a patient in the motel, that's a patient who has confirmed tuberculosis, right? Correct. And, and those patients are put on treatment, okay? And treatment with TB drugs quickly changes the equation, and I'll, I'll come to that in the next thing. 
But once you put people on pills to treat TB, they rapidly become uh, non-contagious. So, so let's say you've got a known TB patient and they're on good TB treatment and they're staying in the motel for a month while they get their life sorted out. And then they're going to move somewhere else out of the motel. That person is not going to be shedding any any organisms in, in the motel room at, at that time. So so at the most an hour if you want to air out the room. But uh, but uh, but the my main guidelines were basically for inpatient rooms where you don't want another vulnerable patient to get exposed. Does that sort of help? Yep. And then Melissa just said we usually use 60 minutes before housekeeping can go into the room to clean it to protect right. the house. Right. Another question is, how long does it take latent or new infection to manifest the disease if untreated? Yeah, well, that's that's a, 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 good, a good question. Uh, uh, let, let's say, you know, let's say on the 1st of September, one of your staff accidentally uh, goes in to, uh, to see a patient who has contagious TB. When will their uh, PPD skin test or their quantifiron test turn positive? from an exposure on, on the 1st of September, it's probably going to take six to eight weeks uh, for, for, for that, that to happen where, where you would, would, would rely on a, a PPD or, or, or point if you're on. So usually we want to check them six to eight weeks after their exposure. And Anna, I'm not sure if you're asking about somebody becoming ill or just when the skin test or IGRA would turn positive. I mean, usually, you know, assuming assuming that, let's say, you know, a nurse walks into the room and does patient care on September the first, and then and then we discover that patient has has contagious tuberculosis. It, it's very. It would be exceedingly uncommon for that nurse to fall ill from from tuberculosis. Uh, this the, the nurse would likely have an intact immune system and would likely convert a, a PPD or quantifuron without <laughs> excuse me clinical illness. Now, on the other hand, if you if this nurse was immune suppressed with cancer treatment or uh, transplant or something like that, then, then you would have to monitor that nurse for other symptoms like fevers or, or lymph nodes uh, uh, if, if you did find that kind of exposure. But that would be uncommon. And she just did say someone becoming ill. Yeah, that would be very uncommon. They, they, would, they would likely have to be immune suppressed. But this is why, you know, if you, if you do identify an incident on the 1st of September, and now, now it's the 8th of September and you know this, this patient has TB. Your employee health is assembling the list of the people who accidentally went into the room uh, uh, and to notify them of, of, of exposure to TB and the need to, to report for, for testing and to report in any symptoms. These, these situations still happen uh, uh, in, in our hospitals. As you know, hospitals are busy. Hospitals are a bit chaotic at times. Emergency rooms are, 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 are busy. And then suddenly 10 days later, we say, oh, this, this guy has, has tuberculosis. So it, we still have to do these kind of investigations a couple times a year where, where, where the diagnosis of TB was delayed or missed or forgotten about. We have one other question about fit testing. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to get fit testing at our facility. And yeah. since COVID, it seems like everybody and their brother is wearing N95s. How important? Yeah. yeah. yeah that's, a, that's a good question. And and, and, I, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know the current regulations about fit, fit testing. As, as you know, during the pandemic, we all had to wear masks and, and it was not feasible to do fit testing on every every uh, employee. You know, fortunately, the pandemic and the masking greatly protected our hospital staff from accidental TB exposures as well. As you know, the the masking reduced us from getting exposure to influenza 
and other things as well as, as, as the COVID-19. So that universal masking saved our necks a few times where we did have a contagious TB patient uh, that was missed or, 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 or recognized in a delayed uh, manner. But fortunately, the masks prevented that. Now we've got our masks off and, and, and we're, we're a little bit more vulnerable. Um, Melissa asks, do they use a VAT procedure to diagnose TB? And if so, when use VAT? I'm sorry, is VAT, you mean VAT? VAT. VAT, VAT is a surgical a biopsy of the lung, like video assisted thoracoscopy. Now, so let's let's say you 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 let me go back to my previous slide. Let's say you've gone through these stages and you've got sputum and you haven't figured out the patient's got TB because they got some problem in their lung, but you're still paranoid about TB because they have some exposure or maybe uh, some some family history of TB, and and then you're going to ask your surgeon, I need lung tissue, and then they sometimes will do a bronchoscopy or sometimes they'll cut between the ribs and take a piece of lung tissue out with a vat to try and get you a more precise di diagnosis. So so that is done on rare occasions where your initial sputum tests are negative, but you're still concerned that it that might be tuberculosis. Now that is also very helpful for diagnosing malignancy uh, and, and other things as well. But even in our busy hospital system, we might do a VAT procedure two or three times a year uh, for, for TB suspects. It's not that common, but it is available as, as an ultimate procedure. I think that's okay. it for the moment. Any other questions? Not yet. So, so, so. Let's say that, you know, on the 1st of September, this patient comes in. Uh, let's say you're fortunate and you put the patient in isolation uh, and then you put the patient on TB treatment by the 2nd of, of September. And how long are we going to keep this person in isolation after we put them on exactly the right treatment? This question probably generates the most arguments in our TB physician community. If you went to the TB conference in Atlanta in June, <clears throat> you, you would get different answers. And this is one of the reasons why this subject is, is being revisited. Now, let's say if you have a patient who is diagnosed with TB on the 1st of September, put on TB medications on the 2nd of September, the first thing you're going to do is say, when can we get this person back home and get them out of the hospital? You don't have to stay in hospital forever with tuberculosis if you've got a stable, supportive home situation. This is where your health department and your TB nurses are going to assess that. We would much rather treat TB at home rather than sticking the patient into an isolation bed in the hospital at great cost and expense. The other thing to, to, to emphasize is that <clears throat> let's say you want to send the patient home and the patient's got a wife and some other family members at home and everyone's worried about exposing the wife and, and the family. Once this person is on TB treatment, they're going to rapidly become non-infectious. The, the, almost all the risk to the wife and family was in the months before the diagnosis of TB was ever obtained in the first place, where no one even thought the patient had TB. And that's where the transmission risk to the family and close contacts was, was before the treatment was started and not two weeks after good effective TB treatment was started. This is always under under uh, appreciated that, that really, if we diagnose TB on the 1st of September, the transmission was likely happening at home during the months of June, July, and August, and not in September when treatment started. Nevertheless, there's still a question about how long do we isolate the patient. So we, there is quite good science that patients rapidly become non-infectious once we start them on multiple drug therapy for TB. And by multiple drugs, 
you know, we're, we're usually using the four TB drugs, the isoniazid, the rifampin, the pyrazinamide, and the ifambutol. This hammers the TB, and it quickly uh, uh, damages the organisms and, and distorts the organism. And, and, and there's quite good evidence that they quickly become non-infectious. We want to make sure the patients are taking their pills. That's one of the reasons why we use directly observed therapy to make sure the patient is swallowing the pills and not goofing around with, with their treatment. Um, and, and, and you usually will see rapid uh, uh, elimination of TB from the sputum and reduction in cough. But there is no ideal test that can say this person is, quote, not contagious or this person is contagious still. This is sort of where we have to put the whole picture together and, 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 and decide. There's no quickie test for contagiousness that, that, that's available. And that's what results in the biggest arguments. This is particularly a headache if the patient is vulnerable and sick and has other problems and has to stay in the hospital. Uh, how long do you have to keep the person in isolation in the hospital? Uh, uh, for example, we have a dialysis patient who has pulmonary TB. That patient is quite weak, quite debilitated, not able to go home, has to stay in the hospital uh, many, many weeks. Uh, and, and then the question is how long to keep the patient in isolation. <clears throat> and, and this is an example of what, what you can see with sputum studies. If you look at before treatment, you've got a positive AFB smear, a positive nucleic acid, and a positive TB culture. By 14 days, you put the patient on treatment. You might see less acid fast, but you can still see uh, acid fast organisms. You don't need to repeat the nucleic acid test, but, but your culture could still be positive after 14 days of treatment. But this person is probably not really contagious at that point. By 28 days, we may still see some acid fast organisms, which, but the culture is negative. In other words, you're seeing dead organisms in, in the sputum. So this is sort of a, an example of how, 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 this, how this plays out. So CDC has said that really there is a 99% reduction in TB in the sputum after 14 to 21 days of treatment. Generally, if, if patients are, are uh, on treatment for 14 to 21 days, in other words, two or three weeks, then they can be taken out of isolation if, if everything is, is going smoothly. This is a little bit trickier in the hospital. If the patient is too debilitated and has to remain in the hospital, you sometimes have to have stricter uh, rules to, to determine that. And that, that's going to, and I won't, we can't go into any greater details that, that needs to be closely coordinated with your infectious disease doctor and infection control staff in the hospital. But, but we'd see rapid reduction in contagiousness. But it does depend on, on whether the patient's going home. It's much easier to send patients home into their environment where they were really contagious long before the diagnosis was made. So, uh, home isolation uh, can be done for, for, for patients if necessary. This requires close cooperation with the health department. And, and, uh, uh, and, and I think I'm going to leave it at that. I think we're just about out of time. Did I, did I run over, Shawada? No, I don't think so. I think we still have some other questions. I hope I... I probably stirred up a whole firestorm of questions. Yeah, we have another 15 minutes, so... Oh, you have another 15 minutes? Yep. Okay, um, let me just... I have a few examples we can try and run through here. Just a second here. Let's take... Let's take... Let's run through these questions and see if, if these help. Here's a question. A nurse has been treated in 2015 for latent TB infection. Is this nurse required to wear an N95 mask to care for a TB suspect in isolation. Uh, in other words, this, this nurse has some immune reaction to TB. This nurse has been has taken isoniazid or rifampin for latent TB. This nurse remains healthy, uh, has a normal x-ray. Uh, th does this nurse need to wear a, a mask at all? Well, 
the answer is yes. This person, you know, a, a person who has had late TB in the past has some limited partial immune protection against tuberculosis, but but it, but it is by no means complete, and it's well known that that a person can get infected with a second strain of tuberculosis, and and so uh, we. we you know, it's interesting. We've run into this occasionally where the nurse says, well, I don't need to wear a mask. I took my isoniazid uh, se several years ago, but that's not the, 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 the correct approach. Um, you, you, you still can be susceptible to uh, infection. Okay. TB, prior TB infection does not confer immunity. Reinfection can occur. N95 mask is necessary. Question number two. A confirmed TB patient is discharged home at 2 p.m. His room can be occupied by a new patient at 2.30, 3.30, 9 o'clock, or the next day. I think we've gone over this, that if he is discharged home at 2 o'clock, then by 3.30, and that would be you know an hour and a half, you've had a, you've had a significant number of air exchanges in, in, in the room and it would be safe for housekeeping to go in at that point in time, really within an hour uh, uh, to, to go in, uh, to clean the room up, prepare it for the next patient, and safely bring a new patient in, into the room. 60 minutes to, is needed. Okay, final question number three. Drug susceptible pulmonary TB is confirmed and my patient has been on DOT for six weeks. He feels much improved. His cough is resolved. But acid fast on smear has been reduced, but is still present at one plus. This is after six weeks of treatment. Does this mean that treatment is failing or that drug resistance has occurred? Very common question that, that we encounter uh, where we where people still see some acid fast on the smear, and and this does the answer to this is no. This does not mean that treatment is failing. Uh, this should not mean that drug resistance has occurred. You can ask a few questions about this, but DOT, which means directly observed therapy, means that. A public health nurse is watching the patient swallow every single dose of medication that guarantees they're getting all the treatment. What we're you're seeing the patient improve. The fact that we're still seeing some organisms on the smear, this probably means those are dead tuberculosis organisms that, that, that are present. So this is not uh, considered to be grounds for alarm or panic or reinstitution of isolation um, as long as you as long as you're providing careful proper outpatient care of patients now just to go back uh, you know when i started tb work in, in 30 years ago there was no such thing as dot we just gave pills to patients and said be a good person and take your pills uh, we did run into problems 30 years ago Patients goof around with their medicine. They skip pills. They don't want to tell you that. Uh, and, and so we did run into problems with treatment failure or, or drug resistance. But DOT has revolutionized our patient care. And we guarantee that 99.9% .9 of their treatment is given. And we get TB treated right the first time and not the second or, or third time. So uh, this quest, this is not a treatment failure. The overall clinical picture is improving, and AFB smears are showing reduced organisms. Dead acid fast may remain visible on smears for several weeks, but consult your TB physician for guidance, as this always causes a little bit of confusion. Well, that's all our slides, but I'm sure there's there's other other questions from 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 the audience that uh, that you've got. This always stirs up lots of questions.
There's one question here that I'm not sure I'm understanding. Allison Smith, do you want to unmute and ask your question about IGRAS? Maybe not. Uh, but I'm looking at her, her question uh, about a patient on dialysis um, uh, who was born in the United States who has an IGRA test that's low positive. Uh, uh, well, as, as I like to say, an IGRA test that's low positive is like a pregnancy test that's low positive. An IGRA that's positive is positive. Um, we, we're a little bit hesitant to start in dissecting IGRAs into low and high positives, um, uh, although a lot of people do that on the side. But but in, in your case, you've got a dialysis patient who's immune suppressed. Therefore, their their immune system might have reduced ability to respond to TB, and therefore they might have quotes a low test, but it's still positive. That person needs to be evaluated clinically for TB probably does not have active TB, but that person would be a high priority patient to treat for latent TB. You do not want active tuberculosis in a dialysis unit like what happened in Michigan this year. Um, and and uh, um, so so that test should be treated with great respect and should, should be given prevention antibiotics for latent TB, assuming the patient is clinically stable. We do all have to recognize that all our tests for TB still remain a little bit fuzzy. PPD tests are not perfect. IGRA blood tests are not perfect. We could still use something even better, but we have to work with the tools that we have available now. There was one comment from Maureen that says, um, this program needs to be offered to every medical school and residency class. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're right. You're right. And, and, and it's, it, it's uh, um, uh, we, we're, we're always bringing students and residents to our TB clinic and they're saying, well, why do we have to go to TB clinic? There's not much TB left any, anymore in Michigan. But, but we want them to recognize that it can still sneak up, it can still blow up in your face in the hospital and some patient who you thought had lung cancer or thought had pneumonia. And even though the radiologist says this looks like metastatic cancer, it could still be something else. And, and, and you have to have to keep your eyes open to, to, to these possibilities. We continue to make great strides in reducing TB in the United States. We we think we can reduce it another 70 or 90% if we, if, we, if we hunt down more latent tuberculosis cases, uh, but, but, but we, that's going to take another 10, 10 years or more of concerted work on things. So thank you for joining us today. I don't see any other questions on here. Anybody want to unmute and ask anything? Thank you, great presentation from Kavita. Shwata, do you have any parting words for us? Yeah, um, I was just waiting to see if anybody else were going to say anything. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Sundstrom, and uh, for present for a great presentation, and Carolyn for moderating. Um, I would like to mention that next week is our last sessions for the TB 101 series, which will be about uh, fundamentals of content investigation, and uh, Patty Woods would be presenting next week. So thank you all. Um, the recording and slides from today's session, as well as last week, will be posted by next week. Um, thank you for, so much for your participation today. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye, everybody. Yeah. Bye-bye.